So I think it really tags on what you said because, or what you prayed, because I've been reading in the book of Samuel and about David's battle. Um, so one of David's greatest earthly <coughs> enemies was Saul, and his greatest friend was Saul's son, Jonathan. So when Saul was trying to kill David, God's anointed, David actually refused to fight him, but ran away instead with Jonathan's help. Um, so it's just amazing to see how even the hardest, toughest battles of our lives, God will overcome for us. David never had a fight with Saul. He never killed Saul. God took him out of the way in his time. Um, another thing is every battle that the Israelites entered into, that they were supposed to enter into, God gave them a very specific plan with very specific instructions. So I believe that part of the reason we're here tonight is to get specific instructions for our battles. Um, and I think that God would even give us a picture or a word now if we asked him. So I'd like to do that. Um, dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this night and for this opportunity to share and come together as your body and uh, for the opportunity to overcome what's standing before us. I thank you, Father, that you do fight our battles and you make a way for us through even the most impossible and darkest situations of our lives. So, Father, right now I just ask for you to do that now, to give us each specific strategies for the problems and struggles that are in our lives, even if that's just to worship you, to lay that thing down and just to worship you with abandon, Father. I thank you for the opportunity to worship you in spirit and in truth. That that is how we fight our battles, is through worship, through adoration and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. You can take that back, please. Take it back. Amen. I told her she couldn't come up here and pray until she schedules it with James. So that <laughs> She got a little preach in her, I think. Welcome to Impact Thursday night. I'm Ken Turner, one of the ministers here at the Impact Ministry Center in Holly Springs, Georgia, just north of Atlanta. Come visit us. Contact information's on the screen. Uh, we always like to say who we are. And most of y'all know in the book of Acts 13, we like to say we're a type of the Antioch church where the prophets and the teachers met. And they actually worshiped the Lord that was the main thing. It said, minister to the Lord. And they sent people out. They called out people in their callings, their destinies. They kind of pushed them out the door. That's what we like to do here. Get you set up for who you're supposed to be and in a nice way kick you out of here to go do what you're supposed to do. But uh, <laughs> they hadn't kicked me out here yet. I, I, think, I, I think I'm close. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll put that down. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. You know, there's one thing, I, one thing I've, I'm learning. I'll, I'll say I'm learning. Uh, love conquers a lot of things. And how many know the agape, the, the work of God's love? Who really knows that? That's, that helps us. Helps me. I don't know about you. I, I'm not a lovable guy usually, but... When I know the Holy Spirit's loving me, that's worth it all. So that's not that's extra, it doesn't cost anything else. But the love of God, I needed to hear that. So thank you, Lord. I want to pray. God's going to, I really anticipate. I've been, had the joy of the Lord all day. And that's, it's been one of the few in a, in a few, a few weeks, a few months, really. But I believe God's going to restore some joy tonight. You know, if you get to joy of the Lord, everybody knows the end of that scripture, you'll get your strength back. And some of us are drained and empty. And God's going to do that tonight. I have faith, but I have faith in the unity of the body of Christ right here that we together will bring joy back into your life. Lord, I thank you that you've brought these people. They're your people, Lord. We're your people. We're a, a unit of your community here on this hill in Holly Springs. And Lord, we want to hear from you tonight. Thank you for the word that you've given James that will teach us, will encourage us, will strengthen us for the things ahead, will help us to battle, will help us to 
cast down those imaginations that come and try to put doubt into us, put fear into us, put shame into us. And so, Lord, we just strip, all, strip off all this stuff. And we come as like little babies, but we need you to impart, to fill us up anew with the Spirit of God tonight, to help us tonight. Some of us need encouragement. Some of us need direction. Some of us just need to know that you love them. That unconditional love, that gut love that we cannot do anything, but you give it to us. For anyone in the room that's walking in shame and doubt, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you meet them right now, that they're the things, even sin is in their life. It could be. It says in First John that we all sin. So forgive us, Lord. Cleanse your body as a whole tonight as we come as one unit. Forgive us of our sins and our trespasses and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And I believe unrighteousness is just not following God. Help us, Lord, to follow you. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name. I want to, uh, I, I think I want to pray. What is your name back behind Prince? Yeah. You, your name, you've been here before. Do you have a word for me? No. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking. No, I'm. Thank you. Father. Thank you, Lord. I'm not sure I have a word for you now. <laughs> You know, God is, you know, the people that come up here, and it, it's, it's funny, you know. Sometimes you just flow with the Lord. Sometimes it's, you know, you want to work it up. But, you know, mm, I got I to gotta tell you what I see. Yeah. Lord, I, I see her on the cross. Your hands and your feet are nailed. And God said, you don't have to keep nailing yourself to that cross. He said, I've given everything you need now. The blood has washed you clean. And God said, I know your heart. I know your, the strengths that you have. And matter of fact, you've been praying about open doors and places, open windows ministry-wise. And God said, I'm getting ready to open the door widely. He said, you try to open the wrong doors sometimes, like we all do, I guess, except for a bill. <laughs> I get, you know, if, you know, God, you know, I, I don't know, but I have to make little jokes. I, that's the reason I know God's real because, you know, I'm not your normal kind of quote prophet. I don't even like to use titles, but, you know, God is funny. He, he'll use anybody if they're available. You're proof of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. But he's open and he's getting ready to do something different in your life. And I see one or two new people, God connections coming into your life. You need somebody to come alongside of you to help you. And it's a God connection. That's all you need for the night. Amen. I want, whoops. Thank you, Father. I ain't been up here in a few weeks. I want to pray for the new girl and then I'm going to let Nate come up and and I forgot your name already. I'm sorry. I'm going to move over here. <laughs> Carrie. Carrie. I'm just going to go off your name. God said, I'm carrying you. I know that's what. Mm. Oh, thank you, Lord. Lord's healing, some inner healing in your life. Not, you're not a bad person. You're, you're a, really a great person. But you love people. There's a lot of women in there, men too, but mostly women because they feel deeper. And you love people unconditionally, but the people don't give back to you what you need. God said, I'm coming tonight to give you back. Over the next six days, seven days, God's going to meet with you in a special way. He's going to come into your bedroom and, and be there to love you. Because sometimes you feel unloved. I do too. But this is special for you tonight. There's inner healing here. 
right now and in the second part of the meeting, God's going to do some inner healing in your life that's going to take those memories out. It's going to take those hurt out. Not that you don't remember them, but you're not going to feel them. You feel them now. That abandonment, that, that shame, all that stuff that was poured on you, set over you as a little girl, as a teenager. But God said, I'm, you're my girl. You're my, I love you unconditionally. I love you right where you are. I brought you here just to let you know that. The love of God is here for you. And you're going to make some God connections tonight. You already have one here with this young lady. But there's other people. And there's some women in the room that are going to come beside you and pray for you because there's situations they can speak into. That as a man, I probably don't need to. But God is delivering you, setting you free and bringing hope and joy. He said, let the past be the past. Live today and look forward to tomorrow. Let the past be the past. That's a good word for all, everybody in the room, everyone watching. Can I touch your hand? Lord, heal this young lady. Heal her of the emotions, all the torment. I come against you, Satan. You have no right to torment this young lady any longer. She has a clear mind. God said, I'm going to let you sleep. With those tormenting things, it's hard to sleep sometimes. I see you're just in turmoil, but God said, I'm going to give you peace even tonight. He's going to give you some sleep and rest. It might be in the night. It might be you taking a nap. Whenever it is, he's going to give you rest and peace. And he's going to give you joy. You're going to be the one unspeakable, full of glory, joy. So I thank you. Thank you for this young lady coming here tonight. You're going to meet, you're going to, you can look at me. You're going to meet some good friends tonight. You got good friends, but you need more good friends. Some of y'all better step up tonight because I'm, I'll be your friend if they want. Well, thank you, Father. You have a word, Bill? No. Uh, thank you. Yeah. I'm going to bring uh, Nathaniel up. I guess that's your name. It's Nathan, or is Nathaniel and Nathan the same? Yeah, believe it or not, it's James Nathaniel. Isn't that weird? Yeah, you got two James in the room. That's I know. About... Isn't that strange? So uh, I tell you what, I'm going to go ahead and pass out the buckets here first. And if uh, y'all will pass them around, I would appreciate that. There you go. And I'll see y'all in a few minutes. He's going to bring up James after he's there through. There you go. So tell him to hurry. No. Yes, I am. I'm hurrying. I'm, I'm just hurrying. Kidding. I'm hurrying. There you go, sir. I guess I could turn this off. Yeah, there you go. So, um, yes, my, my name is Nathan Intrigan. I'm one of the ministers here at uh, Impact. So, uh, just wanted to go through the announcements real quick, and then I also wanted to talk about something that's uh, coming up here um, in, in Atlanta. So, obviously, uh, we already said, you know, we are uh, uh, located here in Holly Springs, at Mountain Brook Retail Center, 2260 Holly Springs Parkway, and... Uh, all the contact information is on the screen, and uh, you know, just as as we were talking about, you know, what we want to do here, especially on Thursday nights, is we want to release people into their into their ministry. Uh, and so this is this is a training and equipping center. So uh, love having everyone come on Thursday nights. We have several services, not only Thursday night, but we also uh, have Impact Prayer Center. We meet on Friday nights uh, for Friday night fire. And what that is, it's just basically a time of uh, intercession and worship. And uh, then what we what we do is uh, while we're worshiping, we really seek the heart of the Father, and uh, we ask Him, you know, what is it that's on your heart? What do you want us to pray? And so there, therefore, when we do that, it's the, the prayers are different every time. And I tell you, it's just a wonderful time just to come in and connect with the Lord. And so I uh, encourage you all to come. Also, on Tuesday nights, we stream uh, IHOP Kansas City just for a couple hours. Just come in and spend some time before the Lord. Bring your Bible study, whatever, whatever it is you want. Or just sit here and soak and just enter in with the, with the worship. So, um, and then on... Uh, Wednesday night, we uh, started back up with School of the Prophets. Last night, we had a great turnout from what I hear. I think we had around 17 people or so. And uh, I tell you, it was just an amazing time. Uh, it, it really is. And if you want to learn uh, about prophecy and learn about the prophetic gift that's within you, I encourage you guys to come out uh, every Wednesday. Um, 
and uh, not really sure how long this time is is, is going to go around this this session, but uh, we'll we'll make that decision soon. So, um, reason why I'm kind of moving through this a little bit quickly is I wanted to talk about what um, what's happening in Atlanta, and this is the uh, one race that's in Stone Mountain. I'll, I'll be honest with you. Whenever I first heard about this, and um, heard what was going on, I really kind of felt like it was just going to be just another political movement. I felt like it was going to be something that, um, you know, we're going to see some, you know, big names in Atlanta come and take some, uh, you know, really some, uh, you know, really take ownership of it and, and really just kind of turn it into something. But once I heard, and I want you guys to listen to this video, it's like a seven minute video, but once I heard the prophetic vision of where this thing came from, this is something that's been 22 years in the making. And we are a prophetic center, and I thought it was very important because what this is talking about, this is talking about coming against two principalities that we struggle with here in, in, in the Atlanta area, that is uh, religion and racism. And... Uh, one of the things that I've seen firsthand is just the huge religious spirit that's over us that divides us, keeps us from really fulfilling the call that the Lord has on each and every church. And what happens with us is when we, uh, you know, here we are, we're praying for revival. We want to see revival released and ignited, but we have these walls of, re of religion and racism. What I wanted to look at that, if you see, this was uh, started by Sean Bolts in 1996, gave a word. Uh, and then even before that, I, I think if you really look at uh, Dr. King's message and what he was, was even saying, he was speaking prophetically of something that he saw that he knew wasn't going to happen in his lifetime. And then not only that, but uh, just what he's talking about. This, I, I'm not saying that this is, this is the all to end all. What I'm saying is that this is a breaking of the ground. Okay, this is a breaking of the ground that is going to cut through and start to overcome those barriers of racism and religion to where we come about and we can actually have true unity. Just like what we had earlier uh, in Woodstock was uh, the power and unity thing was a breaking of the ground. And so what I want what I wanted to, to really bring out with this, that this is this is something that has been prophetically spoken that if we break down these, these barriers, revival can be released throughout Atlanta, just as, as so many people have prophesied. So I want Joanna to be able to pray into this real quick. So, so along with the word that Jesus said, cast your net. And when he said to cast the net, the fish were there. But they'd been fishing all night and didn't find fish. But he said, cast the net. So I want to partner in the spirit with a prophetic word through prayer and just declare that something shifts next Saturday. It was never meant for the White House to carry this. It was meant for the church house. It's God's people. We are the ones that have the authority over these demons to break this. And I, I'm, I, I'm honored to be a part of a company of people that we get to partner together in unity to come against this. So, Father God, we just thank you in Jesus' name, Father, that you're going to be present next Saturday, Father. I thank you, Father God, that every nation will be represented, every tongue, every tribe, Father, your people. Lord God, we truly are neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, but we are one in your spirit. Father, I just thank you, Lord, that you are going to move powerfully on that day, Father God, that you will bind any hindering spirits, you will bind any opposition, you even adjust the weather to be what it needs to be. Father, I thank you for all those who plan to attend will be there, Father. And I just thank you, Lord God, that this center that we send in our prayer and we say yes and amen to the spirit of racism um, and um, for the spirit of religion to come down in the name of Jesus. We declare revival and reconciliation, Father God. We are truly building a house of the fivefold ministry for this season and this hour. So, Father, we want to partner. It is not okay for our brothers and sisters of other colors to be to be um, oppressed, Father. It is not okay for people of my color to be oppressed. We are not to be an oppressed people. We are a people that are kingdom priest up to you, Jesus. It is the enemy that oppresses, but God, you are the deliverer. So, Father, we pray for your deliverance, Father. We pray for your unity, Father God. We pray for your oneness, oh God. Only you can do this. Man cannot. We can't fake it. We don't want to fake it. We just want you to come in and break it. 
Father God, we want to love each other and just fix what might be wrong in our heart that we would truly see each other by the Spirit. So, Father, we just partner with all the leaders. Lord, they have stuck their neck out on this, Father. We just say yes and amen. And, Father, in any way that we can be a support and love and, and financial or whatever the Lord leads, if just being present is it, we'll be present. So, Lord, we just thank you that this Saturday something and the heaven shifts over Atlanta and truly that prophetic word of being a gate city and the truly that revival would hit and the southeast would be aflame with the fire and the revival and the awakening of the Lord that we're all believing for we just thank you for it and we we just love you Jesus you're so awesome in Jesus name amen all right so this time we'll bring up James oh yes Oh, it, it, uh, it's going to, I would suggest go out to the One Race site, but I believe it's starting like as early as uh, like 9, 9 a.m. 8 in the morning, I'm sorry. It's in the grassy area and it's on top, but uh, there's, a, there's limited number of people allowed to go up top. So, you, exactly. It, yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Well, like she said, only the millennials are going to be up, up top with the pastors and, and, and all the rest of that, just because they can't have that many people on top, of, on top of the mountain. So, But, yeah, it's going to be in the grassy area, and I would say come early because it's going to be very crowded. So, anyway, so, all right, James? <laughs> there you go. All right. All right, well, let me just offer a word of prayer. Well, Father, we thank you, Lord. We're excited that you're doing some exciting things here, Father. That, that somehow we just happen to be in the right place at the right time. I really feel that, Lord. That this is a very, very special season. And that things are moving even in this month and even in this season and even in this time. That things are changing radically. And Lord, I thank you that, that, that I sense that you're speaking the words that are going to cause things to happen, Lord. And as you speak them, Lord, they're going to happen. It doesn't matter what's happened in the past. The minute it comes out of your mouth, Lord, and through the mouths of your prophets, Lord, things are going to change. And we're excited to be a part of it. So, Lord, I'm, I thank you for this uh, opportunity to just share a message with the people here today. And I ask you just to open their hearts and minds to receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, welcome. My name is James Trevette, and I am here to do part of 12 of the For the Love of God Gospel of the Kingdom series and part 12 is the last one you'll be thrilled to know so after today you'll know everything there is to know from one end to the other Genesis to Revelation we did cover the entire Bible in this thing but uh, obviously uh, I was hoping that this would just give you some keys that sort of open up the Bible for you that you may understand our purpose in, the, in this lesson sanctification we're going to be sort of bringing it all together. Because if you remember, we, those who were here at the very beginning, where we started was in Genesis. We started in the first three chapters of Genesis. And now we're going to end up, of course, you might guess, in the last three chapters of the Revelation. Because in the first three chapters of Genesis, it was about a marriage and a wedding in, a, in the Garden of Eden. But I believe that's what the last three chapters of the Revelation is about also. Because God declares the end from the beginning. So we started with the wedding and we're going to end with the wedding. So this lesson is called Sanctification. Out of Revelation 19.7 it says, And his bride has made herself ready. Now I didn't really understand what sanctification was all about. But the Lord said I need to teach on it. So I okay Lord, well, you're going to have to show me what it's all about. And when he did, I had a friend that called me. And... She was an intercessor, and she said, I just had a word. And the word that I got was, my bride is putting on her veil. I said, well, what is the significance of that, Lord? And here's the five things that I got. Number one, the spiritual meaning. The wedding is very close. And it's the last part of the preparation is actually putting on the veil. So we're getting very close. 
And of course, the white wedding dress and the veil represent the holiness of the bride. That something holy is about to take place here. And it's not just the bride that's holy, the ceremony, all of these things are holy. So this is something very special unto God. Also, the bride is getting ready to be publicly revealed to the guests and to the world. So it's a special moment when the, the, the music starts and, and the bride comes to the, the back of the sanctuary and, and all of a sudden all turn as, as, she's, as she comes forth. And it's, it's a very special moment. And I believe that that's where we are, that the Lord is getting ready to reveal his bride. But also the bride's getting ready to be intimately revealed to the groom. <clears throat> So the bride's not just preparing to be beautiful for the people. She's prepared to be beautiful to her groom. And it's preparing not just for that moment of the wedding, but for the intimacy that's to follow. And finally, the veil is a covering that will be lifted by the groom and therefore declares that the bride is set apart for him. So as you can imagine, that he will lift the veil and kiss her. Well, that veil there, it means set apart. And the word set apart is the definition of sanctification. So to me, this is a picture of sanctification. This is what we're doing. This is the process that we're going through to prepare for the wedding. And I think a woman knows that if she's going to get married in, say, three weeks, she's not just going to sit around and wait to be raptured thinking everything's going to be all right, I'm just going to hang out, and at some point I'm going to get raptured, and all of this is going to happen. No, you're excited, and you're preparing for that moment, knowing something great is about to happen. And I believe that that's where we are. And I believe that that's what this is all about. So sanctification, the model for this to me, is a bride prepared for her groom. So... In this session, we're going to be talking about what must you do to be sanctified for Jesus when he returns. What's the difference between justification and sanctification? And who is responsible for the sanctification? You or God? So let's get into the scripture and see what the word has to say. First of all, in the last class, that was class 11, to marry the king, he says, what does the Lord mean when he says to be ready? And we used a lot of the scripture, but I wanted to go back and show a few things out of it, just to sort of show where we are, because not everybody saw that about four weeks ago. But it's also the sort of the initi initiation to this, the rest of this message. So let me see if I can get there from here. First of all, we talked about the church of Laodicea. Because the church of Laodicea is the last church. And in this last church, it ends with Revelation 3.21 where it says, To him who overcomes, I give the right to sit with me on my throne. Now, who is it that sits with the king on his throne? Yeah. Exactly, the queen. But it says to him who overcomes. And that's very important here. Because this overcoming is important because not everybody is going to overcome. Remember, this is red letters and it was written to a church. He didn't say to the church that overcomes. He said to the individual that overcomes. And we also know that all of that church probably isn't going to make it. Particularly if we go back about three verses, five verses, where it says, I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either, one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. And of course, as you see, this is a picture from The Bachelor. And it's hard to believe that it's possible that maybe we're a, a reality show up in heaven and and maybe we're seeing who is going to marry the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. 
We think it's going to be the entire church. But I'm sure these people in Laodicea, the church of Laodicea, they thought that they were part of the bride. But as we've been seeing, it's not necessarily everybody that's saved that's the bride. Yes, maybe you'll be in the kingdom, but maybe not everybody's going to be the bride. Because the king has a right to, every man has a right to choose his own bride. And so it doesn't mean that every other person's wrong. It just means this is the one for me. And Jesus is going to be choosing the one. And I believe that that's where we're going. Now, my goal is I want to be in that number. I want to be as, as that bride. Now, it may be enough for many just to be saved and be in the kingdom. But I want to be one of the overcomers that actually sits on the throne with him. Because I don't believe everybody's going to make it. If we go back to Revelation 19, as we did in the, in the message last time, you'll notice it says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. There's the word ready, that she had to be ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear, and fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints, but it also, as we learned, stands for a judgment of righteousness. That when you get that gown, it's a judgment of righteousness. The clothes that you wear represent that righteousness. Now, some may be dressed in white robes and some may be in a wedding gown. I'm not sure how this is going to work. But there is a judgment here. But the judgment is a judgment of righteousness. Then he said to me, right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. So we're seeing two different things here. We're seeing the wedding and the wedding supper. I want to be at the wedding. Because I don't believe the bride has to be invited to the wedding supper. I think those are guests. So I, this is very possibly two separate events. And I want to be the bride. So how do we be ready? Well, we went back and we looked at Matthew 25. And in, we looked at the parable of the ten virgins. We realized that all ten of them had lamps. They all ten thought they were saved. They all had lamps that at one point were burning. But apparently there was five wise and five foolish, and the wise had plenty of oil, and they were able to keep their lamps burning. But the foolish didn't have enough oil, and their lamps started to go out. And it says the virgins who were ready went in, but the others didn't. The ones who were ready are the ones who were able to keep their lamps burning. So there's a difference here, but all of them had a lamp. So we wanted to look at this and say, okay, obviously we don't want to be the foolish, we want to be the wise. And that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. We went back to the very first verse that we started in class one. The very first verse that we shared in the purpose of creation was Ephesians 5.17. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. So obviously the foolish ones are the ones that didn't make it in. So we want to understand what it is so we can make it in. So I went back to Ephesians 5, and it discusses this. And if you'll notice down in 532, it specifically talks about, I'm speaking in reference to Christ and the church. So this is the picture right here. So he's saying, wives, be subject to your own husbands as unto the Lord. Husbands, love your wives. So remember, what he's talking about is this is the model for Christ and the church. So when he's saying, wives, submit yourselves to husbands, what is he talking about? He's talking about us. We are, our goal is to submit ourselves to him. He's there to love us. But our responsibility is to submit ourselves to him. It says that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water of the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. And you notice I included the two Greek words here. Hagios, which is the end state, to be holy and blameless. And hagiazo, hagios and hagiazo. Hagiazo is the process that you go through to become hagios. And we learned from the last class that that's a declaration. At some point when you're in the Hagiazo, the sanctification process, at some point you're declared righteous. Maybe it's when you get that gown. But there's a righteousness declared because I believe the Hagiazo process is a never-ending process. 
It's a continuous thing. You never reach that point on your own. But at some point, God, the Lord is going to declare that when he says, this is my bride. So let's look and understand a little bit about these terms. So the term hagiaso means to make holy, to purify, to consecrate, to venerate, to sanctify. So it is a process. This is a verb. It's a process. It's something that we need to enter into. And the goal is to become the state of hagios, which is physically pure, morally blameless, holy. So we want to know how is this happened and who's supposed to do it. First of all, I want to look at the terms justification and sanctification. Because I think there's some confusion about these two things. Justification is the process where God declares a person to be righteous on the basis of faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So justification is the activity of God which liberates a person from the guilt of sin. This is salvation, okay? You are saved. It happens. Boom. You have the Holy Spirit. You're saved. You're justified before God. But then there's a process after that called sanctification. And it's the activity of God which liberates the Christian from the power of sin. You see, if you got saved and you had a cold before you were saved and you got saved, do you think you might still have a cold? Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Did, did your life just get perfect the, the minute you were saved? Did every, all your problems go away? No. You became holy and righteous that very moment, true? No, you had the Holy Spirit, but there's a process that begins. And this is one of the sort of the fallacies of a lot of the gospel that says once you're saved, that's the end point. But I believe salvation is the beginning point. And at that point now, there becomes the sanctification process. So we need to understand that sanctification process because they all ten had the lamp. All of them had the justified lamp. <laughs> but they just didn't have the oil to keep them all burning. So let's take a look at these terms. Now I've put in this to say that the justification means that you've got a spirit. And that spirit is absolutely holy and perfect in salvation. You receive the Holy Spirit. Your, your spirit has become whole. It's become one with the Holy Spirit. And it, that spirit is perfect. But your soul at that point still needs a little work, wouldn't you say? Yeah. So that's a sanctification. It works from the spirit into the soul. So let's go back to our Ephesians. And let's look at Ephesians 5.25 again. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave herself up for him, her, that he might sanctify her. It says he's going to do the sanctification, right? So do we have to do anything? That's the question. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her, how? By the washing of the water of the word. That he might present to himself the church in all her glory. Well, first of all, the church in all her glory. Isn't that everybody? And so I'm praying about this, saying, Lord, it sounds like that's the church. But he said, no, that word's not the church. It's the ecclesia. See, the ecclesia are the called out. Yes, it's usually translated at church. But you're called out from something. Invited. That's right. So you're called out from the world, but it can also have a, a, a modifier or a descriptor. For instance, the ecclesia or the church of Ephesus, it represents those called out at Ephesus, right? So he said, go back and read it again. So I read it and it said that he might present to himself the church in all her glory. And I went back and read it and what that says is the glorious church. That's the modifier. He's calling out the glorious church. These are the church that have yielded into the glorious process. Having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she should be hagios, holy and blameless. Can you see that this is a process? Being washed is a process. So how does this take place? Well, it actually tells you that right here. You're washed with what? 
the water of the word. So let's see how Jesus said it in John 17. He said, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I'm not of it. So you understand if, if salvation was the end point, and once you're saved, why are you still here? Isn't that the whole end point? But what if there's a process, a process and a reason for actually still being down here? So he said, protect them from the evil one. What is the evil one here to do? What's Still kill, destroy, and particularly deceive, right? And I believe that he will give us a spirit that protects us from that deception. So we will know the choice to make. We will know the truth that we can be free from the power of the enemy. He's given us truth. And that truth can break the power of sin in our life. So he protects us from the evil one. And then he goes on to say, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. So here's your sanctification process. It's the word. And I believe it's not just the written word. I believe it's hearing his word. It's a relationship with him. It's communing with him. And that washing of that communion and that word is the process that sanctifies you. And he says, as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. Now we look like it's, the sent is just like as a missionary. But what if there's a process in here that's actually important for us? Let me read on and I'll show you. For them I sanctify myself. He was sent into the world. But it doesn't say just as a missionary. It's said to go through a sanctification process. But now wait a minute. Why would, wait a minute. would Jesus have to be sanctified? We think he's, I mean, isn't he perfect? Isn't he without sin? So why would he go through a sanctification process? It says, by the way, <laughs> for, I, for them I sanctify myself. You see, what he's done is he's established a process for us. He, did he have to do it? Well, probably not. I mean, he was pretty holy. He was the de definition of holy. But he goes through the process because he's making a way for us. I think they call the original Christianity, the way, because he says, I make a way for you. Well, that way is a process. That's why he got baptized by John. That's why he went through the whole thing is to lay out a process for us. And he says, for them I sanctify myself, what? That they may too may be truly sanctified. So you see, this is the process. He, had, he, he studied the word. He communed with the Father. He went through all of the same things that he's asking us to go through. The sanctification process. So he's telling us exactly how to do this right here. In Hebrews, it's said this way. For the word of God is living and active. Now, is the word of God living? I thought it was on dead stone tablets. No, we serve a living word, right? The Holy Spirit is the living word inside of us. So the word of God is living in us. And is he active? Oh, yeah. That means active means he does something. Is he doing something in you? He's living and he's active. Unfortunately, the law couldn't do it, right? Because it says the bloods of sheep and goats could never make righteous. Because it did not have a sanctification process. But the living word does. It's active and sharper than any double-edged sword. And it penetrates. You ever have the word of God penetrate into you? And what does it do? It divides soul and spirit. It says, this is a you and this is a me. Joined in marrow and it judges. Wait a minute. I didn't think we were going to be judged. Well, if anybody saw Don's message, know that that's not exactly the case. Judgment is what you want, and you want to embrace that judgment. Because the judgment is his truth. 
and you want to say, yes, I want your judgment. I want your truth upon me because I want to see this cut because I know that if you show me what's of you and what's this, I can repent and be free from it. But see, that's a process that he does. We submit to it, but he has the power to free us if we'll yield to it. We, if we'll embrace the judgment. So it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So what part of you do you think he's trying to deal with? How about the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart, right? So what parts of your life? Nothing in all of creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? You need to decide that. <laughs> if I had one question that you need an answer to, that's it. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Because do you want to embrace his judgment? Because do you want him in all parts of your life? See, this is, this is really where the difference is. See, it's in here we have some locked doors. And we're, we're saying, hey, I can't deal with this right now. After all, those are things God didn't know about anyway, right? Because they happened before you were saved, true? And he didn't know what's there, right? No. You see how this works. There are things that you can't get free from because you haven't opened that door. You haven't invited him in. And that's what he's saying. But luckily, he gives us something else. Verse 16, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence. Wait a minute, we're saved. Why would we need that? Because we just embraced the judgment of the sword. But he said, even if you embrace it, you can approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we can receive mercy. Theoretically, we wouldn't need that, right? Unless you're embracing the judgment. You see how this works? He's got a plan here and find grace to help in our time of need. So he's got a solution here. He's going to do the work, but you've got to open the door. You've got to invite him in. If we go back to Matthew 25, remember the five wise and the five foolish. The ones who were wise were ready and went in, but the foolish ones, notice at the bottom, Verse 12, but he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Now, wait a minute, he's God. I thought he knew everybody. But see, this is a different kind of no, isn't it? I, I, I haven't been hanging out. We haven't been hanging out. We haven't come together. You haven't opened all those doors. I don't know you because I've, if, you don't give, if you don't open the door to me, that's your choice. He knows about it, but he doesn't know you. And that's your choice. We'll see that. Let's look at it, John 10. But you do not believe because you're not my sheep. He had a real simple way with words, right? So, because these people thought they're saved, they're going to heaven, everything's fine. He said, no, you're not my sheep. How do you know? Because my sheep do what? They listen to my voice. I what? Know them, and they follow me. So you see, these are the sheep. Now, of course, there's probably goats here too, but goats, they also hear the voice, but what do they do? Whatever they want, right? That's the difference. How you separate sheep from goats? Well, you call them. And the sheep do what? They listen to my voice, and they follow me. And the goats don't. So it's actually fairly simple to separate the sheeps and the goats here. But he says, I know them. So this is the ones we're talking about here. Go a little further. Matthew 7, these are red letters. Many will say to me on that day. Now, I don't know if you guys remember, I had principles. One of them was I, that God declares the end from the beginning. But principle three was the principle of the few and the many. So when you see the word many and few, which one do you want to be? Right. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? 
Then he will plain, then he will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. See, because you're not doing his will, you're doing your own will, and he said it's an evildoer. Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine, puts them into practice, is like a wise man. So there's your wise, right? We saw the foolish, and now we've seen the wise. So it's really that simple. It's, it sounds simple, but are we doing it? Is he in all parts of your life? So let's look the way Paul described it in Romans. So it's a little complex, got a lot of colors here, makes it really busy, but it's pretty. But uh, I did it so that if you go back on the video and look at it, you'll sort of understand how all this fits together. Because this diagram, for those who have been through the class, you'll understand what this diagram is about. If this is the first time seeing it, this may be a little confusing. But just to give you an idea what this diagram is about, we have this little guy. And the little guy is the spirit, soul, and body. And this little guy diagram, is this a saved guy or an unsaved guy? It's a saved guy. And how do we know that? Because he has a spirit and he has access to the tree of life through Jesus Christ. He can eat of the tree of life and live forever. So he's saved. He wouldn't have that whole part up there, that gold part, if he wasn't saved. But just because you're saved, have you made the only choice that you need to make? No, because now you're, you're that little soul. That's you, that little guy in the middle. And he's, so that's you, your mind, will, and your emotions. And you're sitting there looking, and you've got a choice. You can yield to the flesh, or you can yield to the spirit. And there's your two covenants all the way back to the two trees. The performance-based tree or the identity-based tree. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, by definition of the law or the tree of life, Jesus Christ. But you have a choice. Just because you made the choice to be saved, that now gives you an option to make yet another choice. So this person is probably justified, but they're, we don't know if they're sanctified because we don't know which way they're yielded. So let's look at Romans 6. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, let's look at that. In other words, before you were saved, you didn't even have the other option. But now that you're saved, you still have the option. You can still present your members as slaves to the impurity. You don't have to be a slave anymore because you broke that power. But he said, okay, you're submitting yourself to that. So he says, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness. Boom. You have a choice. Present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. So can you see how sanctification works? But now, having been freed from the power of the sin, you have a choice. You didn't have that choice before. Now you got the choice, but you still got to make the choice. And enslaved to God, you derive your benefit, resulting in sanctification. So you understand the sanctification process. It's not an end point. Remember, hagiaso is the process. Hagios is the end state. You'll never get there. You'll just be in the process. But at some point, he's going to come and say, well done, and declare you righteous. Now understand, there's a declaration already of justification. But I'm talking about the bride here. And the outcome, eternal life, which of course is the tree of life. For the wages of sin is death. Why? Because it's performance-based. It's earned. If you yield to this, it produces death. Because you're on the old covenant, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat of that tree, you shall surely die. die. But the free gift of God is eternal life, the tree of life. You can't earn it. It's not your works. See, you can't sanctify yourself. It's not a DIY project. That's why he says he must do it. But you do have a part in it. 
Because God wants to be loved. We studied that. And love requires a choice. But your choice isn't to sanctify yourself. Your choice is to do what? Yield to His Spirit, right? To commune with Him. And I included Matthew 11, 28, 30. It says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. That little guy down there, you, that little soul thing, it says that if you submit to him and learn from him, whatever process you think you're in now, it's actually easier. I mean, we're, we're, we're making it sound like it's difficult, but it's not. He's saying, no, he's, he's comparing this, the yoke, his yoke. He's contrasting that to what other yoke? The yoke of the law, right? And we know that doesn't work really well, and we know it's heavy, right? But he's saying the yoke of sanctification is a light yoke. And it'll even bring you rest, a place of rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So whatever you're doing now, this is easier. Because all you have to do is yield, and he does the work. On the other side, you've got to do the work. It's a good plan. Let's go back to the church of Laodicea. He says, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, let's stop right there. First of all, did it say, if anyone hears me knocking? No, it says, anyone hears my voice. Remember, my sheep hear my voice. So where do you think, if, first of all, if he's knocking on the door, do you think he's on the inside or he's on the outside? Yeah, he's on the outside. So can you see that there's parts of your life where he's standing at the door and knocking on? And if you hear his voice, he's going to open, literally open that door and let him in? But wait a minute, Lord, there's things I'm doing that just, they're very evil. I need to stop that. I can't. Wait a minute. You can't do it anyway. You can't stop it. What you need to do is invite him in. You're saying, but you don't know what my thoughts are. And I said, did you invite God into it? He said, well, I lusted after that woman. Well, did you pray for her? Did you invite me into that? Did you look at her and say, Lord, I'm asking, I'm going to pray for her. Lord, I bless her and, and, and pray for her parents that, and begin to see it God's way. Let him into the situation. Don't say, hey, Lord, I've got to clean this up because, God, I'm going to be ashamed. No, invite him into the mess. He's standing at the door and knocking. And he says, if, you, if anyone hears my voice and opens that door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. So here is the intimacy that you need. He'll clean up that closet. But you need to do it. You need to open that door. And then it says, to him who overcomes, I give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame. See, he was the model and sat down with my father on his throne. What must we do to be ready? You need to commune with Jesus. You need to hear his voice, study his word. You need to follow him. You need to obey his words. You need to yield your whole life to the Lord's sanctification process. Whatever it is that you can't break, you probably don't have him in the middle of it. You're probably not. While you're doing it, you didn't invite him along. Invite him along? Into, yes, invite him along. You'd be surprised what's going to happen. He can take a situation and change it completely. But more than that, he can change your heart and he can set you free from it. And of course, you need to keep watch with expectation and prepare for his return. After all, there's a wedding coming. Are you going to be ready? Luke 21 said, Be careful. Or your own hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you unexpectedly like a trap. 
For it will come upon all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that's about to happen. You need to escape dissipation, drunkenness, anxieties. You need to escape everything. And that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Now you may say, stand means during the judgment I'm going to be able to stand up. But I don't think that's what it says. In a wedding, who stands before the groom? The bride. That's what he's saying. That you may be the one who stands before the groom. Not one of the guests, but the bride. Sanctification. And his bride has made herself ready. What must you do to be sanctified? And for Jesus, when he returns, you must yield to him. You must open all of the doors of your life. Let him, he'll put his finger on them. Remember, he says, I stand at the door and knock. And if you just invite him in. Don did a great teaching on the difference between judgment and, and tribulation and wrath and so on. You want to embrace judgment. You want to invite him in. You want these things cleaned out and be free. What's the difference between justification and sanctification? You're saved. You're justified. But sanctification is a process that you go through yielding yourself unto God. Who's responsible for your sanctification, God or you? Lord. Yes. He says, I'm willing. But you got to open the door. He says, I'll knock on it. But when I knock on it, you got to open it. Thank you, Lord. Sanctification. Well, Lord, we thank you, Father. We want to be in that number. We want the purification, Lord. We want to stand before you on that day. So, Lord, we ask you. We invite you. We invite your judgment in. We invite that two-edged sword in. We want to hear your word, the written and the, 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 the logos and the rhema. We want to hear what it is that you're saying. In every situation, we want to open all those doors that we may be set free from this power that's held us back. And we want to be cleansed and pure, Lord. We want to be able to wear that white gown. We want to be able to wear that veil on that day. So, Lord, if there's anything that needs to be dealt with, I thank you, Lord, that you'll touch each one here. That you'll start knocking on those doors, Lord, and give them a choice. And Lord, I pray that you give them the boldness and the throne of grace is open, Lord, to receive mercy in time of need. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all. Part two now, part two. <laughs> Thank you, James. That's, uh, awesome. Yeah. that's awesome. I'm... Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. There's a scripture. I believe I'm, excuse me for, I know it's in the New Testament. Y'all not. I need to say something funny. Y'all not y'all sleep. <laughs> y'all not scared now, are you? No. Here's a good one for us tonight. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Along with James's message, Lord, I thank you that in our innermost being, your spirit rests there. Your spirit's available, Lord. We come tonight and ask you to 
each one here, each one watching, those living waters are available. The Holy Spirit's available to just let the water flow all inside of you, in your mind, in your body, and all those thoughts, anything that you're involved in that you want to be rid of. Lord, we ask you to, as a group, come into those areas. We all have areas, Lord, so come into those strongholds, those patterns, those flesh patterns that we fall back into when we're tired and we uh, just get angry. Come and cleanse us. Come in and, and change us. Sanctify us, Lord, that we can be more and more like you every day. Father, I thank you there's a spirit of righteousness in the room tonight, not because anything but except you, Lord. You're the righteous one that we line up with. So, Lord, we do lay everything on the table tonight. We ask you to do the John 3.30, the less of me and more of you, Lord. We ask you to come in and change us. Let us die to those things that we follow after that's not of you, Lord, that soul, that thing that we choose, those things that we choose daily, Lord. It's hard to, to walk in this. But only only reason we can is the Holy Spirit's power and the love of God. And Lord, I ask you to, to fill everyone in the room, everyone watching with your spirit. We need a new infilling to go where we're going to be going in the future. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Where's my... I guess she's... I'm, I'm, since we started the School of the Prophets last night, uh, I'm going to... Does any of the School of the Prophet people have a word for anybody? No, you're... You might be the queen of the... <laughs> Well, someone, come up here and give it. Okay. That's what I'm... Well, I just want to be sensitive. Um, is it for me? No. Oh. <laughs> it's from our friend Julie. <laughs> I know somebody's... Really? <laughs> That's good. So, I was back there because, um, you know, I know you. And I love you. And I respect you. But I kept hearing, it's crazy that you came on this night. But the Lord said, you are one that's going to prepare the bride. And what I sense is God has taken you in a different season. Not a different, but a deeper. And um, he's calling you to be one to disciple the spirit-filled group. Because there's been a big disconnect between the word and the spirit. There's been so much focus in the word and the spirit that some of the words been left out. But what I saw on you is almost like in the, um, the denominational side, like the Priscilla Charlie, the Beth Moore, all that, I saw you coming up as a spiritful one that will mimic this on the side of the fullness of the spirit, that you would take the word and the spirit of the word and you would marry it in such a way that a generation would become in contact with the living God. And what I sense is that this is it's a call, it's a shift. Okay, this is a shift, and it's going to take a lot of time. It's not going to come up overnight, but this is something that's even going to mark the church. This is something that's going to mark you guys. And, and at some point, David, with the apostolic part, it's all going to fit. I'm not sure how that works. But this call has been birthed in you since you've come in the kingdom. And now he's going to accelerate it. He's going to accelerate, and he's going to bring provision. And he's going to bring connection, because this is going to take resources. You're going to need that for this. But this is a big deal. I really sense this is a kingdom thing, and it's something that's needed. And God said, my daughter, your heart has pleased me. You have been after me. You have chased after me, and you have not been satisfied 
with that what you've read and that what you've been taught. You've respected, you've honored, and you've cherished it. And you have given honor where honors due. But the Lord says, you have not been satisfied. And this is why I've called you and chosen you for this task. And yes, it is big and it is monumental, but you can do this. My spirit is deep within you. My hunger in you cannot be satiated apart from this because I am calling you to raise up a generation in the spirit-filled truth of my word. And in that, you will be known as one that discipled those in this generation into the truth of the knowledge of the things of God, that they will no longer be tossed to and fro, but they will be on the straight and narrow, for they will truly be a bride made ready and set apart on that day. So my daughter, just yield to the process walk it out step by step I'll lead you I'll guide you I'll provide for you every step of the way and trust my spirit is with you my hand is upon you and my love is close to you thank you Lord. amen and the word I heard he says and the sons of Issachar knew the time and the season and they knew what to do they knew the time they knew the season and she knows what to do for he says there's been a paradigm shift even now. But timing and what to do is a key. For you cannot duplicate the old in this season. For new wine is for new wine skins. And I call you new wine. And I'm pouring you into something new. Do not depend on what you've seen in the past. For I want you to rest in my spirit. For she who has an ear will hear what I am saying to her. Not necessarily about her, but about my people, about my house, about my bride, about my church. So humble yourself, says the Lord, and war against the lies of the enemy. Resist the devil, resist him, resist. Go into warfare mode. For he will come with the spirit of depression to tell you that God will not do all that he promised. But God says, I equip you and empower you to break the lies. And then I heard him say, draw. Draw near to me. Yield it all, says God. Open up every door now, says God. No more shall you withhold from me that that I desire. I knock, you open, I sanctify. I'm going to tell you, this is this on, yes. What I saw, I'm going to tell you what I saw and what I actually heard. When you were worshiping, I was back in the corner over there, and I saw, it was like, it was like lightning, but it was electrical, and it was blue electrical currents, and they were coming into both your hands. And it was the Father, and he's saying, I'm not, you're not full. I'm filling you up. I'm filling you up to overflow. You will have a constant overflow. He is pulling you. He is pushing you. He is giving you. You've pursued and pursued and he is taking you into a dimension in him where you're going to hear things that are absolutely outrageous and he is outrageous and he says, I'm going to take me out of the box that I have been put in and it's not necessarily that you just put him there. Man has put him there and he's going to take himself out of that box he's going to talk to you he's going to speak to you he's going to show you things you're going to see things that you cannot possibly explain and when when um joanna said the discipling i heard the word mothering you are going to mother many sons and daughters and it's going to be revelatory that electrical current has changed your dna tonight it has changed your dna tonight because the lord he is going to so be in you and you are going to so be one in him that you are going to be lost in him and you will be definitely, uh, you will be living in the kingdom, walking in the earth, releasing the glory of God in his revelation. And the father says, do not fear the strange things that I will ask you to do and show you to do. I have prepared you for this. I will be with you. I will go ahead of you. I will be behind you. I am, I am, I am, I am. I don't have it. Okay. So, hello. I got a word for you, Ken. Oh, Lord. <laughs> I, got a good, I got a good word for you. When we were talking on the phone oh, earlier today, me up. you remember? 
I just got blessed. Actually, I just got blessed because the scripture verse you just read about rivers of living water. Remember the vision I had of you? You were in a river, in a canoe, in a river, in the current. Yep. It was a river of living water, the river of life. So I, I was encouraged that you said the verse you said. So just wanted to encourage you. That Thank you. You may need to paddle a little bit, but but really, <laughs> I'm gonna relax. He's, he his, he's got the direction for you yeah. handled. And um, thank you. I have a word for Donald. I'm, I've never been a new person prophetic. Pro, I mean, I get so anyway. Donald, um, you know, you you said to me earlier, but I seen the number twenty two, and I sat back there and pondered that for a minute, but. I think what I'm, what I'm supposed to be telling you is that this is you've entered a new uh, place with all this, and the Lord is. It's like that that game, the scavenger hunt. You know, when He tells you He's saying something to you, and you're going, it's like dark speech. You know, He'll say something to you, and you're going, what does that mean? Why are you doing that? What are you showing me that repeatedly for? You remember Billy? In the video, he said he had a vision of RXR. And when he was praying and praying for confirmation, he opened his eyes and there he saw a railroad crossing, which was RXR, basically confirming what God had already said. So in these scavenger hunts, you, know, you, you may see this number 22 several times, and then all of a sudden, this is what I call it. I call it your aha moment. You know? When you go, oh, that's what you meant. And there's a, there's a time between him speaking to you and a time when he gives you understanding. And in that time, you're seeking him and you're alert and you're spending time with him. And then the, full, and then the fullness of time, he gives you understanding on the word. But he gave that to me for you like it's like a scavenger hunt. Just take that 22 and wait and see what he says next. Amen. But there's a reason for it. And I'm, I want you to tell me what it is when it happens. Okay? Give it to uh, that young lady coming up this way. Stay for a minute or two. I think, I'm, come up here. This is good. I have a corporate word. Um, for a couple days now, God has been giving me a picture it started as just a large pipe coming down and then he showed me that the pipe was made of iron sorry i don't know why i'm emotional <laughs> and yep. then he is it on and then today he showed me that at the elbow of the pipe the pipe comes down and it it hits us and at the elbow of the pipe it fans out into a lot of smaller iron pipes and they're very long and so the ends of the pipes are very where they release it's very spread out and tonight through the preaching and the worship what the Lord showed me is that what he's giving us is not just knowledge because knowledge just puffs up but it's the wisdom and the power of Christ and it's coming down in that elbow of the pipe is the unity and the breaking out of the pipes is the diversity. And it, it fits with the, the prophetic movement that's going to happen at Stone Mountain. That This is a season where God wants us to yeah. receive, to release, you, and to reap for the kingdom. Christ, what he received from God, he passed on to others. What we receive to God, we are to pass on to others. Yeah. This is a time for us to be strong, but... We're the vessel. We're the pipe. We're hollow. We need to. We need to not just hang on to it. That's what knowledge does. But we need to release it, and it needs to go out um, to reach the people. Amen. I think somebody else. Amen. That's good. I believe the Lord has given me a corporate word. Good. And um, I don't want to leave you out, you people watching online, because I specifically saw through technology who I was speaking to. And the Lord showed me the bride. 
and you guys were walking and you were doing life. You were living for the Lord. You were walking in God's will and it was good. And then it was like swat underneath your knees. Something came and about broke you and all you could do was go down. Okay. And the Lord, I, I, I said, whoa, Lord. And it was just like, it was like the enemy came and out of nowhere, like took something. But I just felt God's joy because you, at that down point, you got on your knees and prayed. You said, I'm not going to be bitter. I'm not going to do everything uh, like neighbor against neighbor. I'm going to love. I'm going to love. I'm going to learn how to love because I don't love right now. And you did. You got victory over that thing that just knocked you down. And at the and when you were down, you were humbled and it was beautiful. It was beautiful. The process and everything that you went through was beautiful. And then out of safety, I just saw the body of Christ just kind of hold like almost nervous to get back up again and the Lord said it's time to get back up and I actually saw almost like a tug of war going on with the heart and interestingly enough he was pulling and it wasn't like time to get up it was you held some gifts privately and secretly that you learned on your knees and he said, it's time to share them. It's time to walk in them. And some of them are really creative. And the scripture that came to me from the beginning was Psalms 144. He trains our hands to war. You learned how to war when you were on your knees. And that enemy is going to be so sorry that he ever messed with you because it was down there when he was trying to bring you down. When you get up, you have that weapon. And it's the creativity of song. It's the creativity of worship. Some of it's writing. Some of you guys are going to write a book. Some of you, it's just drawing and painting and music. And it's the most unique thing that took you down, humbled you, raised you up. You made the right decision and now you are going to take out the enemy and what he's done and the different people around you that he has torn down they're not gonna have to go through that process all you need is to get up bring them up and boom let's move on thank you I felt like God was honored by you that you would be strong enough and willing enough to do it because you help so many more people the enemy thought he won he's just so stupid so I just really feel God's love on that um, for you what a beautiful humble powerful strong victorious bride you are you really really are amen I'm going to invite OJ to come up and close but thank y'all school of the prophet people coming up you can join with us, the other people that have never been. That was, uh, Thank you, Lord. God wants to use us. And I'm going to let OJ uh, pray. And if you want to pray into that Stone Mountain meeting, too, that's good, too. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for your word today, oh God. We thank your word for about sanctification. But the beauty of your word is you said you would do it. So, Father God, we come tonight yielding, submitting to you. We come in complete submission unto you. As the wife submits unto the husband, so we submit unto Christ. Father, we come in the spirit of meekness, saying we are weak, we are helpless, we are hopeless without you. But God, we come tonight with a heart of gratitude because you have given us a promise that if we will yield and surrender to you, you would do the work for us. So, Father, we just want to say thank you tonight. We want to thank you, Father, for what you will do on Stone Mountain. Father, we submit this unto you. For your word says, oh God, it's not by might. It's not by our power, but it's by your spirit, says the Lord. And Father, where man will strive to make things happen, tonight we come and we say, Jesus, you're the vine. We are the branches, 
and we are nothing without you. And our heart's cry tonight is help us, oh God. Be merciful unto us. For we need your mercy as a nation, as a church, as a people. Father God, we cry out tonight, America needs your mercy. The church and our nation needs your mercy, oh God. We cry out for mercy and grace. Oh God, come down and revive this nation. Revive the church in this nation. Father, our cries make us one as you are one, oh God. Drive out the spirit of division and bring a spirit of unity upon our nation. Father, the heart's cry for this nation in this hour is that you will visit us again. That you will move by the power of your spirit, oh God. And that the church will come alive. That we will be living stones, living testimonies. Oh God, we're in need of you. Sanctify us. As we open every door in our hearts. In the body of Christ. As we open every door in our nation, oh God. And we invite you in. And we say, have your way. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. We are dismissed.